Hello and welcome to La Jolla Presbyterian Church's Sermon Podcast for Sunday, July 29th, 2018. This morning, Rev. Dr. Paul Cunningham is back in the pulpit and sharing the 10th segment of the Summer Sermon Series on the Book of James. The series is called Finding the Balance, Faith That Works, and today's sermon is titled Coming Close to God. We're looking at the scripture of James, chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Please listen after the sermon for a few announcements. You can also learn about what's happening at La Jolla Press by visiting our website, ljpress.org, downloading the La Jolla Press app on your smartphone or tablet, or by contacting the church office at 858 854-0713. And now, here's Paul with Coming Close to God. Well, first of all, I want to thank our summer choir. Great job, you all. I know you're taking the uh, month of August off, but thank you um, for your leadership and your service. So um, they will take the month of August back, and they'll be back with us uh, in September. But it's always great uh, to have them singing behind us, or singing behind me at least, and at least laughing at my jokes when nobody else laughs at my jokes. So that's always uh, always much appreciated. So thank you. Uh, sometimes people ask me, um, what am I reading? What are the different books that I'm reading? And, um, and so I, I just finished a book that I'll put up on the screen that I found fascinating. It's called Leadership for a Fractured World. And it's uh, not a Christian book. It actually has a forward from the Dalai Lama. So, but actually there's a lot of um, Christian principles in it. Dean Williams is a professor at Harvard uh, University. And um, he really kind of takes on this idea. And if you've been keeping up in leadership world in the last uh, seven, eight, ten years um, or so, you know, there's a lot of language around um, technical change and adaptive change. And what's the difference between technical change and adaptive change? And I'm not going to go into all of that uh, this morning. And um, I mean, you're more than welcome to take a look at this book if you're if you're trying to keep up on. And I think really in terms of what leaders, what good leadership looks like, um, this book really gets at it, and it has a lot to do with things that we as Christians would talk about of how do we lead with humility and how do we lead with wisdom. He talks about how do we how do we build bridges, how do we break through boundaries um, that exist, how do we um, deal with tribalism because even us as a congregation, we we basically function as a tribe. We we have different ideas that we live by and mantras that we hold to and theology that we think is um, quite important to us. And, and, and as I was reading that, it, he, he tells a story, and some of you may remember this, um, a guy named Dr. Robert Coles, who was a professor at Harvard as well, in the late 60s, uh, got together with a pediatrician who taught at Yale University by the name of Milton Sen. And they went down to the deep south because they were very concerned about what they perceived to be a general, um, an overall sense of malnutrition that was happening in the deep south, particularly uh, in Mississippi. And they did all of this research around um, what was happening, particularly the children um, growing, you can take that off now, so um, growing up with a sense of malnutrition. And, and, and rat, wrote a rather, um, and you may remember this, I, I wasn't really, a, I was barely alive when all of this was happening, but Robert Coles wrote a number of books called Children of Crisis. It was like a five series thing, and the first one was about his research. I remember reading it in seminary with, with child development and that sort of stuff. Um, but, but wrote a series of books about, about children. So, so Sen and Coles write this rather scathing report um, saying basically the level of malnutrition in the f- deep south of the United States was as bad or worse than the level of malnutrition in third world countries, um, which is a pretty sad, pathetic sort of thing to think about, that that was the level uh, that we were at. And so they, they wrote this report, they sent it to the senators, sent it to the House of Representatives, sent it to leading United States officials, and basically everybody blew it off except for one person. Because what was happening with that is it was going against the status quo. And the one person who, who, who was bothered extremely by this was Robert Kennedy. And Robert Kennedy went to Coles and Sen and said, we have to do something about that. And, and, and those two guys, Coles, Robert Coles and, and Milton Sen, kind of got, um, got their egos up and said, we've told everybody what has to happen. We've told everybody we need to fix this problem. And Robert Kennedy said to them, The two of you cannot lead this change. He said, you are perceived 
as intellectuals from the north. And there is no way that your voice will be heard in the deep south. And so what he said is you need to take one of the doctors who was on your team that did all this research, a man by the name of Dr. Raymond Wheeler, and he said, let him lead the charge. Let him become your spokesperson. Let him describe what's happening in the deep south. And changes will happen. And so in one of Cole's, as he writes his biography, he said, that was such a changing moment for me because I thought I was so right I thought I knew exactly what needed to happen, and I had no humility at all about it. And he said, and Robert Kennedy was able to help me to see that I needed to learn some things, that I needed to understand that though I might have the solution and I might have the best research, I was not the person to carry the project forward. A lesson learned in humility. And I think for us, as we think about how we live, how we lead, how we serve, Scripture has much to teach us about humility, about what it looks like to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God. And so that's what we want to talk about this morning is what does it mean to live with humility? As James talks about this in, in James chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 12, I'm grateful for Sarah Carter who was here uh, last week and kind of talked about our posture and, and how it is that we relate to God. And, and this morning we want to come back to the first part of chapter 4 and think about what does it mean to live with humility. I'm not really sure who said this. Um, it, it, I think some people say Rick Warren. Some people say C.S. Lewis. I know it was not C.S. Lewis, so I'm not sure where it comes from. But, but I've always liked this idea of saying that humility is not thinking less of ourselves, but it's thinking of ourselves less often. So if you think about that, humility is not thinking less of ourselves. It's, it, it, it's, not, it's not putting us down. It's basically it's saying, it's not thinking less of ourselves. It's just thinking about ourselves less often. And C.S. Lewis basically said, the truly humble person never thinks about themselves. Because they're always living for another. They're always living for God. But James says there's the struggle in the church that he's writing to about how we walk and live with humility. And so that's going to be our text this morning. We're in James chapter 4. We're going to start um, at verse 1 if you'd like to follow along. And I would invite you to pray with me first. God, to live with humility is a struggle. It's a struggle against our own desires. It's a struggle against our own egos. It's a struggle to think of ourselves less often and think of others more often. Because that is just simply not the world we are accustomed to. But it is the world and the way in which we are called to live. So God, as we take a look at these words of James, as he um, continues to kind of hammer on his listeners, hammer on that early church, we ask and pray um, that we would be able to learn that God, even in these uh, words that James writes, there's something that we can grab a hold of and that we can cling to. So Lord, that we might truly walk humbly with you. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so James chapter 4, verse 1. He says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people. Basically, this is one Greek word. It's the word adulteresses. But in English, we make that three words, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. 
Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? What a great text to come back to, right? I mean, just James, he just keeps going and going and going and going. And and just, you know, know, setting things straight, hopefully, but doing it in a way that, that is really challenging and convicting. And he starts off by talking about our desires. And it's interesting that word's used, but I think it's used three or four times in the first three verses. Uh, it's the word hedone, where we get our word hedonism. And it's all about this idea of living for self, living for pleasure. And James says, do you see what happens when you live like this? You set yourself at war within yourself because you want this or you want that, and it's in conflict with all these other things. And he says, and in the midst of that, you leave God out of the equation. That with your desires and the things that you're chasing after, the things that you covet, the things that you cannot have, God gets left out. And he continues that, that mindset. And what's interesting is as you get to the end of what we were just reading this morning, we're not going to spend much time on the first part, the first three verses there. But he talks about, and we get to verse 11, he says, this is what happens when our desires take over our lives. Says, we get to this place in verse 11. He says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Because remember, James is all about how we use our words. And he says, when you slander one another, when you tear one another apart, when you push another person down, when you do not treat them as though they are created in the image of God, as though they are set apart, as though they are a holy person, as they are anointed, he says, you do great damage. And he says, and when you're not living with humility, this is what happens. We want to get ahead. We want to advance. And so we gossip. We slander. We talk about other things. We talk about other people. And we all do this. Pastors do this. I know you'd probably be absolutely surprised to know that pastors do this as well. Did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear about the stupid thing they did at their church? You guys are shocked that we would say things like that, right? We all do this. We slander. And Jesus, if you remember in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus basically equates slander with murder. So this is serious business. And when James says you're living with your own desires, you're missing missing the mark and not living fully for Jesus, then he gets to verse 4 and he says, you know what you're like? You're adulterers. You're all having an affair on God. That's literally what he says. He says, when your desires take precedent over your desire for God, you're no better than what happens in the book of Hosea as he writes about his wife leaving him and having an affair on him and removing herself from the covenant. He says, it's the same thing that happens And this is why I think James is really helpful for us as we think about our lives because we know, we're like, well, murder is wrong. We we absolutely positively know that. But how many of us gossip? And how many of us slander? And how many people cut other people down so that we might get something? And James says, be very careful. Walk with 
humility. Count others better than yourself. And I will say in this day and age, that can be a very difficult thing to do, to consider others better than ourselves. But James has some advice, which is good, because we need some advice. Like we know, okay, this is wrong. This is something we don't want to be about. And he says this in verse 7. He says, here's what the answer is. Submit yourselves then to God. And then in verse 8, he says, come near to God. So what I like about James, though it's a struggle and it's hard to read and it's hard to, you know, as I told you in the very beginning, I mean, he, he is just like imperative after imperative after imperative. 60 whatever verses are imperatives in the entire book of James. And, and he just he keeps hammering and hammering and hammering. But at least every now and then he says, okay, but here, here's the antidote. I'm going to tell you the problem. I'm going to tell you the dilemma. And now I'm going to tell you what else can happen. How it gets better. Submitting ourselves to God, coming close to God. Jeremiah 29. The people of Israel, you may recall, um, have gone off into exile. Jeremiah is the prophet who comes to them and says, God will return you home. It will eventually work out. And God promises that. This is verses 13 and 14. God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. You will seek me and find me. When you seek with all your heart. You see, that's why in the first chapter of James, and I feel like I keep going back to this again and again and again, but it's so important when James says, look, God's word is not a mirror that you simply glance at and then keep walking and never return to it again. He is saying you've got to take a look into it. You've got to see what that mirror has to offer. You have to see who you are in light of that mirror. And and so God says in Jeremiah, he says, look, you're in exile. You're feeling as though you are broken. You're feeling as though you have no hope. And he says, look, if you will seek me with all of your heart, I will be found. I will bring you back home. I will give you a hope and a future. Because that is the promise that God gives to us, even in the midst of our own uncertainty, our own brokenness, our own lack of humility. There is this constant idea that God's like, I want you to come close to me. I want you to draw close to me. Let's think about the story of Moses. Exodus chapter 3. Moses, by the way, was no saint. Okay? You remember why Moses was where he was? Why was he out in the plains of Midian hanging out? He killed somebody. Y'all remember that? This is why, I mean, Scripture can be amazingly depressing, but it can also be amazingly encouraging, okay? Because people like Moses somehow get called by God to lead the people out of Israel. He had killed an Egyptian who was messing with an Israelite, right? And then he took off for his life. Sometimes we forget about that. So Moses is minding his own business, right? He's walking along, and all of a sudden there's this burning bush, that is not consumed. That is weird. I've never seen that in my entire life, right? Something burns, it gets consumed. And as he gets closer, all of a sudden a voice calls out and says, Moses. And Moses has to be thinking, someone knows my name? I'm out here in the middle of nowhere? There's this burning bush that is not consumed. Someone is calling me by name. And Moses, of course, starts moseying on up, right? He's like, oh, yeah, there's the burning bush. And God says, stop. Take off your sandals, Moses. You're standing on holy ground. 
And only after that does God say, I am the God of your fathers. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. And now I have come down for my people. And that story of Moses needs to be an encouragement in understanding how it is that God says, I will draw close. That, that James says, hey, draw close to God. We know that that's possible because God draws close to us first. It's the same thing that happens in the life of Jesus. God comes down. He doesn't come down in the form of a burning bush. He comes down in the form of a human infant born of a virgin. But he comes down to save He comes down to give hope. He comes down to make our lives holy. And this is why James can write with such authority, I think, but also with a sense of encouragement when he says, draw close to God. Come closer in. Because it is in that process of drawing closer to God that I am convinced we not only learn more of who God is, but we learn more of how God wants us to live. About how we actually live with humility. Because so much of what we hear around us and so much of what is said and so much of what is taught goes completely against that. But the question then becomes for our lives is who's going to drive? Who ultimately sits in the driver's seat? Because so many of us we want to drive. Now, see, and here's what's weird about me. I, I, I readily admit all the time, my family will admit it for me if I ever did not admit this. I have certain control issues. <laughs> and I have control issues when it comes to driving. I don't even like to drive. But I like even worse, guess what? Somebody else driving. And so whenever we drive, whenever we go anywhere, I mean, my, my poor daughter, when we drove up to Spokane last year for, for college and we took her car up there, um, I just kept on saying, hey, I'll just keep driving. I'll just keep driving. I'll just keep driving. And she's like, Dad, you've driven for like 10 hours. She's, I was like, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. You know, like trying to be all humble and everything else. But the problem is this. I don't want her behind the wheel when I'm sitting next to her, okay? I don't want anybody doing that for me. And it's one thing when it's driving, But it's a whole different thing when it's our life. And are we willing to slide over? Are we willing to see that God has a better plan? And that often God's plan has to do with changing us, changing me. You see, because when I'm not living out of humility, I am constantly in the process of trying to change others rather than allowing and seeing what it is that God might be trying to do in my own heart and in my own life. Who gets the wheel? And you know the people of Israel, they struggled against us. Moses got the wheel. He let God drive. And, but Mo, poor Moses, man, he took it on the chin all the time with people grumbling and complaining against him as he tried to lead with humility and he tried to lead with grace. So how do we do this well? What does it look like to live with humility? What are the actions that that, that we can take? Uh, There's probably a lot more that that we could go into today. I'm not going to go into all of them. I want to suggest a couple of things. One is there is a sense of repentance when it comes to living with humility. 
There is a sense that we sometimes go so far out in our own way, in our own direction, in our own schemes, our own strategies, that we get completely away from God. We see this in the story of the prodigal. That great parable that we talk about a number of times and, 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 and the younger son who basically develops his own scheme and his own strategy. He says, I'm walking away from my father's house. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to devise my own strategies. And I'm going to live well. And then he comes to this point where things are no longer going well. When all of his scheming and all of his strategy has left him completely empty. And he has to make a decision. What am I going to do? And he returns to the Father. And that understanding of what repentance is, is turning. It's turning back toward at least as we think about it as Christians, it's turning back toward God. And if we are going to live with humility, I am convinced that on a regular basis, we need to be examining our lives for where we have gone astray, for where we think our plans are better than God's plans, for when we think our way of driving is better than God's way of driving, for when we think our destination is more important than God's destination. Because I am going to guess, and I don't want to speak for all of you, but I'll speak for myself, that many of us don't spend a lot of time in reflection. That we get so caught up in busyness, craziness. It almost becomes a sense of pride, right? How busy we are. And there's no reflection. And therefore, there's no repentance for having strayed far away from God. So that's one thing. Second thing, we do it here every Sunday morning. It's worship. Worship reminds us of something that truly matters. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the Apostle Paul gives us um, a good reminder of what worship, what should be happening in worship. He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Offer your lives, offer your bodies to the living God. We cannot do this by ourselves. We gather in worship. We gather to praise the living God because we are reminded here of something that is very important. That we're not the ones who get the glory. We love the glory when we get it, but we're not ultimately the ones who are worthy of the glory. But rather, it is God. We've uh, talked about this before, and I, 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 love, um, I love the writing of David Brooks. I think he does some, brings some great insights and wisdom. Uh, but a couple years ago, he wrote a book where he talked about the difference between resume virtues and eulogy virtues. Think about that. Resume virtues and eulogy virtues. You come to church so that you can work on your eulogy virtues, Okay? Because what's happening out there and what's happening when you go out in the world, you are working on your resume virtues. Your resume virtues say, this is what I have done. This is what I have accomplished. Look at all these things. Look at the names. Look at the background. I mean, I hate when people are like, give us your biography. I'm like, I, I, I mean, I'm like, I just don't want to do that. I don't, people don't need to know those things. I'm like, people need to know those things. I'm like, they don't, they do, you know, you have this all. Because those are my resume virtues about how many degrees I have and where I went to school and what I've done and yada, 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 what boards I serve on. Those are resume virtues and they work in the world. 
but they're not the virtues that matter. Because as Brooks argues, it's the eulogy virtues that matter. Those are your moral virtues. And he says, that's what you should be concerned with. What sort of legacy you leave behind in others. Remember, that, that's the idea of legacy. What are we leaving behind in others? And worship grounds us. It reminds us that we are not our own, that we were bought with a price. So we worship, we repent. And then perhaps the hardest one, at least for me, is this. Remembering that my way is not always the best way. And that's a hard one. Because a tendency, oftentimes, for many of us, is to think, I've got it all figured out. I'm faster. I'm smarter. I mean, if I went around this room and asked how many degrees we have in this room, how many advanced degrees, how many PhDs, MDs, I mean, on, I, I don't even want to get started because I know the mind power and the brain power that exists in this room. And so for a lot of us, we have to get through this idea that my way is not always the best way. I am reminded of this every time I go on a mission trip. God has a great way of showing up and saying, Paul, you're so dumb. You think you are so smart, but you really aren't. So I'm going to show you one. We're going to start. I've got three pictures. We're going to start with the first picture. I want to show you this, and I want to kind of speak to a couple of these things. So, this is the house that we built. This is, it's not quite totally finished here at this point. But I want to show you something. I want you to notice how high that house is off the ground. It's 10 feet. So the bottom of that house is 10 feet off the ground. And that's why you can look at those people and you're like, and so by the time we're putting the roof on top of that house, we're a good 20 feet off the top of the ground. So if some of you saw that, and I know some of, you, some of you saw the picture that I posted this on Facebook, and others of you have said this to me as well, of saying, where's the handrail? <laughs> right? I mean, you're 10 feet off the ground, all this. And so me and my wisdom, I'm thinking the exact same thing. Where's the handrail? So I asked the question, because I'm a cautious, careful person, Right? And this woman that, with her seven children, they're ranging age from basically four to 20 that are moving to this house. And our construction superintendent says to me, she's afraid her kids will slide down the rail. <laughs> she's a pretty smart mom. She's afraid they'll mess with the rail. Oh, lesson learned from Paul who thought he had it all figured out. Why do you build a house 10 feet off the ground? I mean, they get some rain and they get, you know, heavy rains every now and then, but it does not need to be 10 feet off the ground. Because what? I'm smarter, right? You build it four feet off the ground, it's a heck of a lot easier to get to that house. People aren't scared and nervous when they're putting the tin roof on top of the house. But you know what happens when you have 10 feet underneath your house, what you can do? You can hang hammocks and you can catch the breeze. You can build a little pad and store all of your stuff. You get a second living space. Ah, pretty smart. You see, I walk into that situation with my Western first world eyes. Let's make common sense. Let's figure this out. I don't even know anything about construction, but I like to think I know lots about construction, right? And they've got it all figured out. A book came out years ago called When Helping Hurts. And When Helping Hurts basically suggests there's three ways of doing mission. And, and it, changed, it changed me forever the way I think about mission. 
they said there's rehabilitation, or actually there's relief is the first stage of mission. Relief is after a catastrophic event, we go in and we make a difference. It's immediate impact, relief. And the book basically argues that too many churches constantly live in the world of relief. We go in and we fix it and we're gone. But it goes on to say there's two more components to mission that are truly vital. And I think this is true in third world countries. It's true here as well. It's not just relief. The second stage is rehabilitation. How do you help to rehabilitate a community? So we got the second picture, and this is part of what we do when we go. So this is our team, 20 of us, along with Norma. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Great team. So part of the way, what we've done, we've been in the same village for the last eight years. This is the seventh house that we've built. And so what we're doing is we're beginning to rehabilitate. But we don't only do that, we do medical missions as well. So we bring in a team of a couple of doctors. And this year we had a nutritionist, which was great because the rate of diabetes and beliefs is very high. Had a dietitian talking, or a nutritionist talking about diet. And it's saying this is a part of what we do. It's not just relief because at this point relief is not what's needed. It's rehabilitation. It's going into the community and truly making a difference. And the final thing what they talk about in this book was it's about development. So we bring relief. We bring rehabilitation. And then we figure out ways to help bring development to a community. So I've got a third picture up there. You might recognize one of those guys up there. Uh, this picture was taken three years ago. Um, so in the middle of the picture, about the two little Belizean boys, is a woman named Esther. We got to know Esther three years ago when we were in Belize. She was a fill-in teacher that was brought in at the last moment to help with a class of 55 students. They had one teacher, and they needed some help. They emailed our church to say, would you provide a little money to help Esther come and teach? So as we got to know Esther, we learned that her true desire was to be a full-time credentialed teacher. But she did not have the funds to do that. She did not have what we would consider, I mean, it's probably $600 U.S. a year to get her teaching credential. And so we as a church and we as our team said, we want you to become a teacher. So we're down there this year, three years later. Esther has two weeks of school left. And then she'll do her internship, and in the fall, she'll be a full-time teacher. This is called development, because it forever changes her and her husband's life. It allows them to be able to pay for their own children's education. And so what I learn, that's great, you can turn that down now, every, every time I go down to Belize, it's a lesson in humility. It's a lesson where God says, I've got such bigger plans than you'll ever have. I can do so much more than you can ever imagine. And so quit thinking that you know more. Live with humility. Humility. And I want to suggest that we've all got some growing to do in that area. That James says, let's try. Humble yourselves in the sight of God, he says, and the Lord will lift you up. 
You'll get raised up to places like you never possibly imagined. If you will just walk with humility, if you will just go in with a learning attitude and be ready to see what it is that God might be teaching you, James says God will lift you up. And then I want to end with this because I know that sometimes this is tough and we fail. I fail miserably at trying to walk with humility. But I love verse 6 and I just is like, I got to end with verse 6 because it's such a great verse and it's such a great reminder of who this God is and what he's all about. And it's just simply six words in describing what God is all about. And he says that James says this, but he gives us more grace. But do you know what God does? He gives us more grace. Not just enough grace, he gives us more grace. So even when we mess it up, even when we live for ourselves, even when we don't repent, even when we do not worship as we should, even when we think we know more than anybody else knows, God still gives us grace. And there is no greater hope for me than that, than in the midst of James just rattling off all these issues that his church has and all these ways they need to live and all the ways they're tearing each other apart. He still says in the midst of all of that, God gives us more grace. I will tell you something. I am so grateful for that grace that has come to us through Jesus Christ. The one who says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. I am so grateful for that because it reminds me that though I fail and I mess it up, God's grace is sufficient. And he gives us more grace. Let's pray. Uh, God, thanks this morning. Thanks for um, a couple of visible reminders that we don't always know best. And Lord, that we should be lifelong learners. That God, we should be concerned about our eulogy virtues rather than our resume virtues. That we should be figuring out what it means to walk humbly with you. Lord, would you show us what that looks like? Would you make us a more reflective people? And would you remind us always that you want to give to us more grace? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for listening. Here's some of what's happening here at La Jolla Press. On August 12th, right after the second service from 1130 to 3 p.m., We'll meet at Torrey Pine State Reserve and go for a beautiful moderate hike in one of San Diego's most scenic locations. Save the date and more details will follow. For more information, contact Mike Sedgwick at mikes at ljpress.org. Also on Sunday, August 12th, we'll be doing beach baptisms from 4 to 5 p.m. at La Jolla Beach, south of the children's pool. We only do the beach baptisms once a year. And it's a great way to celebrate this momentous occasion out in God's beautiful creation. To be baptized, you need to make an appointment with a pastor. To get it set up, contact Michelle Whitney at michellew at ljpress.org. You can find a complete listing of what's going on at La Jolla Press on our website, ljpress.org. That's ljpres.org. Or call the church office at 858 454 one three. We hope you have a wonderful week full of many blessings, and we hope to see you soon.